going to introduce Andrea Lee now, and she, um, I've known her since before Methodist when she worked with the brilliant father of radio embolization, Dr. Ken, um, Dr. Andrew Kennedy, and we've been friends ever since, and I'm, I can't tell you how thrilled that I am she is in Dallas now. Andrea. My name is Andrea Lee, and I'm the oncology program manager at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, we met in Nashville when I was working as a nurse navigator. Um, but I just kind of wanted to talk to you today about the importance of having a team and what that looks like and how that can change treatment options and what's discussed. So I brought one of our teams here to speak with you today. So before you got a diagnosis of cancer, most people have a general practitioner. They've got one doctor that they see for everything, you know, maybe you've gone to see a specialist if there was something specifically that was wrong, but when all of a sudden you've got a diagnosis of cancer, you've got a medical team, you've got a pathologist who's looking at the cells under a microscope and telling you exactly what the different components are and how those things behave. You've got a radiologist who's looking at the images on a scan and, you know, telling the rest of the team here's where the tumor is and here's the different structures that it's close to. If it's a surgical oncologist, um, hopefully, who's looking at those images. Um, and if you haven't had a surgical oncologist look at your scans, it's always important to make sure that the surgeon does look at the images versus someone else reading the report and saying, yes, resectable, no, not resectable. You want that decision to come from that person. Um, but then also you've got a medical oncologist who's you know, working with that team and telling you what chemotherapy, what systemic agents are available, um, an interventional radiologist who is telling you what treatments, what liver-directed therapies are available for you in that particular situation. And, and you're in the center, so you've got all of these different specialists who are trained to see the problem from different ways. And it can be a little overwhelming, to say the least. Um, one of the places that they discuss these cases is at a tumor board. So I just threw up some questions to ask your doctor, um, like, was my case discussed at a tumor board? Where all of those different specialists are sitting around a table looking at imaging and pathology and talking about what they have to offer for you. Um, and looking at you as a whole person, not just the disease, but, you know, what else is, where are you at in your life? Um, not everybody wants the same thing. So asking yourself what's important to me is just as important as all of those other opinions because you're the one who gets to make that choice. Um, you know, I think when I was a navigator, I would call my patients after tumor board and I would say, okay, here's what the discussion looked like. Here's what surgical oncology said. Here's what medical oncology said. Here's what radiation and interventional radiology said. Here's the different pros and cons of each one of those things. Here's the consensus that was reached, but I'll meet you at your appointment when you come back in and we can discuss all of this and talk about what's right for you. Um, it's nice to have someone to translate Oncology is its own language, and once people start talking in all of these words, it's, you know, you're just thinking, like, I don't understand what's happening, I don't know what that means, and as soon as you start thinking about all of those things, it becomes hard to listen to what's actually being told to you, much less remember it and make decisions based on it. So having a nurse navigator, I don't know, can you raise your hand if you have a nurse navigator? Just a couple of you, yeah. So that's someone who works with your whole medical team. You know, they know each one of those different specialties. They work with all of them. They walk you through the process, and they're your central point of contact um, versus calling one office and calling another office and another office and leaving messages and hoping that those people talk to one another. Um, a nurse navigator really streamlines that process. They're your advocate throughout the whole thing. Um, they're there to help support and guide you, educate you on things that, you know, maybe you didn't understand the first time around or forgot, and when you get home, you just need someone to call and translate all of that complex medical information. So if you don't have 
a team, you can ask for one. I think you know, that's sort of my message here is to be an active participant in your care. The healthcare system is great and it's so much better. I mean, you know, we're just constantly advancing and learning new things, but it can be overwhelming. And, and what you say to your doctor changes what your doctor says back to you. So if you ask about these things, was my case discussed at a tumor board? What did they talk about? What are the different options? Then your provider will give you information about that. But if you don't ask any of those questions, you, you may or may not. Um, have that information shared. It just depends. So. How many of you have experienced stress as a result of your cancer journey? <laughs> How many of you have experienced anxiety? Depression? If you look around, that's normal for the cancer experience. It's not pleasurable, but it is part of the shared human experience. So. I wanted to take a minute and talk with you today about the importance of how you use your mind and how that affects your physiology. So prior to the last 20, 30 years, mind-body medicine was sort of seen as something that was only on the fringes. It was kind of woo-woo and maybe you know all that hippie stuff. But advances in neuroscience have shown us that how we use our mind actually changes the structure of our brain and it changes the signals that are sent to the rest of our body, which changes how we're in relationship to our internal experience as well as how we're in relationship to our external experience. We are able to listen and remember. So my area of interest is in judgment and decision making, cognition and perception, how we filter information in and out depending on the focus of our attention. So just for a minute, Direct your attention to the back wall, the farthest wall that you can see from wherever you're sitting. Now direct your attention to the center of the room, wherever that is for you. Do you notice how you can intentionally direct the focus of your attention? So the idea is to be able to use these things to help us navigate these challenging situations. So the body is only ever in the present moment. It can only exist in one place in any given time. Right now, all of you are sitting here. And as you've been sitting here, I would venture to guess that at some point, your, maybe your mind has wandered, something someone said has triggered the memory of an experience, and you reflect back on that. And then to ask a question, how does the information being presented to me in the present moment impact what I've been through and where I might go in the future? So kind of the way all of that works, just a brief overview, is our hippocampus stores the memory of the experiences that we've had. Our amygdala stores the emotion. And that's how the information is encoded. It's based on that underlying emotion. So I was thinking about it, Suzanne, in terms of you and talking about hope and the difference in hope versus hopelessness. And in the beginning, you know, you get a diagnosis of cancer and how you interpret that information is based on your own past experience, what those associations are, if you've ever had a family member who may have gone through something, um, what that meant to you, how that felt, that then becomes the filter that you're taking in energy and information through. Now, that filter might not be accurate, and oftentimes it isn't, right? Because cancer is personalized, it's specific. One person's cancer isn't another person's, which is why when people give us advice about, oh, I knew this person, and you know, they had this, and they had that, if it's not your situation, that information can sometimes not be very helpful, right? Particularly if it's, um, a fear-based memory that they're sharing. Because then the next experience that we go to, information, say your oncologist says something or your surgeon says something that you know, triggers a similar shared feeling, you reflect back on that experience, and then in your present moment, that's what's being used to guide your reactions. And what that feels like is we start thinking about something and then we start feeling it. So I think, um, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm in this situation. Oh, this is so bad, this is so bad, 
you know, my mind is wandering to the past, it's ruminating, I'm thinking the same repetitive thought over and over again, this is so bad, this is so bad. Those, are sending, those thoughts are sending signals to the rest of my body, so then I start feeling tense and anxious. The more I start feeling tense and anxious, the more I start thinking anxious thoughts, the more I think anxious thoughts, the more I feel ten anxious. And then all of a sudden, I'm walking around as an embodied mental state. I am anxiety. When that happens, memories tend to co-activate. So one will activate the next, activate the next, and we're no longer in the present moment. So the networks in our brain that govern rumination and mind wandering versus being mindful and engaged in your present, they can't actually be active at the same time, which is useful if we're in the present and we're trying to plan or organize information, take steps. It's, it's not a bad thing. It's just can not really serve us when it gets out of control. So your stress response sends signals throughout all of your body. That first picture, you know, you're, you're, something stressful happens, your sympathetic nervous system, you know, your heart rate starts to increase, your pupils dilate, your um, digestion slows down, you know, all of these different physiologic responses based on how we're perceiving information. The research right now is so interesting. Um, the impact of stress on our physiology, on our immune system, on inflammation. My area of interest is in mindfulness. So mindfulness is um, attention and awareness. And what the research presently shows, actually Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for her research um, in telomeres, which are the little caps at the ends of your DNA that protect your DNA from damage. And what it shows is that when you practice these different techniques, it actually preserves the length of those telomeres that protect your DNA from breaking down and causing disease and illness. And then at the bottom, that, the last little image is supposed to symbolize epigenetics, which is a field that is really just starting to boom, which shows that our experiences can turn genes on and off in our DNA and dictate what's expressed and what's passed down. So, being in the present moment can be a challenge though, right? Especially when our present moment isn't where we want to be. It's not pleasurable. Our tendency is to, because we are pain-avoiding, pleasure-seeking mammals, if our present moment is uncomfortable, our mind will go somewhere else. But and we think that that'll make things more comfortable, but actually whatever we're resisting tends to grow and make it worse. So one of the, one of the foundational attitudes of mindfulness is acceptance. And acceptance doesn't mean that you have to accept things and just be passive about it. It means instead of wishing something were different, accepting what is gives us the power to change it. And what people find is that when they accept what the present moment is bringing, the pain that they're experiencing is less. That the pain that they experience when they resist it, oh, I don't want to feel that, I don't want to feel that, oh, that hurts, actually makes it worse than just becoming aware of what's going on. Saying, um, this is a moment of suffering. Labeling it is one way to step outside of it. So when you're able to say, you know, this is what I'm experiencing, this is a moment of suffering, I am experiencing pain, you're no longer the, just the subjective participant experiencing it. You're able to objectively witness it. I called this one recognizing cognitive distortions. Um, our brain believes storylines. It has to do with learning and memory, and this happens in relation to that, and me as the subjective observer, I derive meaning as a result of it. And that internal dialogue can be either self-critical or compassionate, and those two things feel very different. And it's about being effective, right? It's about being able to effectively show up in the present moment and navigate these situations to understand all of the complex information that's being thrown at us, terms that we don't understand, knowing what questions to ask, being able to remember. And if we're caught in our mind ruminating, it becomes very difficult to, what was that question I needed to ask or what was I gonna say? Um, so some of the things to watch out for are the self-critical 
um, the self-critical tone that, that we tend to take with ourselves. So I should have, oh, you know, I should have done this, I should have done that, you know, I should have known better. Um, it's not very helpful, really, and it changes actually the memory of that experience because then we start feeling negatively, and the next time we're in that situation and we recall that past event, it's that emotion that's carried forward that we use to guide decisions moving forward. Versus if it's compassionate, suffering is a part of the human experience, labeling it, this is a moment of suffering, here's what I'm experiencing, that's okay. Look around the room. Everyone in here experiences the same underlying feelings. Even though the situations might look different, we basically all feel the same stuff. And so having compassion for yourself in that moment then also changes how changes the emotion that, that, that the memory of that experience is stored with. So locus of control. Just like when I asked you to intentionally direct your attention to the far wall and then back to the center of the room, that's our locus of control. And what the research shows is that happiness and well-being is linked to having an internally oriented locus of control, which is focused on what I can do, versus an outwardly oriented locus of control, which is focused on what's happening to me. So what's happening to me, I can't always control. The only thing I can control is what I do. All of you going through something very difficult, you came here to do what you could. So just some little tips. Paying attention to what's happening with your body when it's happening. Where does the tightness sit? Is there tightness in my chest? Is there tightness in my abdomen? There's information that's coming up from the body to the brain, and there's a time delay it's called bottom-up communication. We're sensing beings taking in all of this information, and it's stored all over. You have over 100 billion brain cells in your GI tract alone. So there's all of these networks of information that are constantly sending and receiving signals. So, and when, I, I, I always notice the feeling first. First I notice the tightness, and then I ask, what was that just a reflection of? So, Learning to work with your thoughts. When I ask myself, you know, what was the thought that was just spurring that feeling? I see the reflection of that. Oh, this is just so bad, or you should have done this, you should have done that. And then asking myself questions like, is there another, perhaps more beneficial way to see this situation? You know, human thinking is embedded with all of these biases and general rules of thumb or heuristics. So knowing that I have a tendency toward a negativity bias, I'm most likely to, dis to settle on the worst possible thing, even if it's not the most likely to happen. And then I also have a confirmation bias. So I'm going to see information that confirms what I already believe to be true. So asking myself in those moments, is this thing that you know, this worst possible scenario that I'm just convinced is absolutely going to happen, is that the most likely thing? Is it any more likely than any other outcome? And if it is in those moments, having compassion for myself, accepting, okay, that's what's happening, and then intentionally redirecting my attention. So there's different exercises that you can, that you can practice that are grounded in neuroscience. So affirmations are one of those things, looking for silver linings. So even in the worst of situations, finding the silver lining, the more you practice doing that, it primes your brain, so then you spot them more easily. The more you practice intentionally being grateful, you know, hear the different things that happen today, especially in the worst of days. When you look for that thing, you see more of it. Giving yourself permission to decrease toxic elements in your life. There are some things that you know, we have to do and we have to put up with, but also those things that we can get rid of or minimize that are bringing us dissatisfaction, giving yourself permission to, and only you know what's right for you. There's no hard and fast rules about any of it. Um, but being gentle with yourself and then increasing joy by savoring the experience of the good things. The more we practice drawing our attention to that, we experience more of it.